Hi everyone, before I start anything, um, what I'd like to tell you is that if you have any questions during the talk, after the talk, throughout the day for me, then um, I've opened what's called a Socrative room for you, well, even though it doesn't appear, right, that's great, um, so there's absolutely no point now. Um, if <laughs> If you go on Twitter, if you're following me, you can see the Socrative room number um, pinned. All you have to do is go to m.socrative.com. So that should have appeared there, but clearly it hasn't because it didn't say it right. So that's a good start. Um, right, so I'll talk you through what we're going to do today. But I think both for me, for Andy, and also for Inga later, um, there's very little point in doing a talk about social media without knowing how involved or not involved um, your audience is actually in social media. So. What I would like to do is just have a, a quick, old school, non-social media, non-digital show of hands, please. Um, who has a Twitter profile? I don't care if it's active, inactive, neglected, dusty. Okay, right, thank you. And then the next one. Who has got their own blog? A blog that's, that's, that's run by you, not your institution, not... Right, okay, decidedly fewer people. And um, who uses any other social media profiles for professional purposes? So I don't want to know about your private Facebook accounts, whatever you do with them. Okay, so things like Google Plus, Academia.edu. Okay, right. So definitely the vast majority are on Twitter. Okay, that's good to know. So I'll give you an overview of what I want to do today. And the important thing is, please feel free. I won't be offended if you interrupt me at, at any point. If you have a burning question and you just want to shout it out, you can't keep it in, then please do so. I won't be offended. Um, so we'll start with um, what I would call digital selves and about bringing your skills to life. So how social media can actually help your existing CV and to actually showcase what you do. Um, then I want to talk a little bit more about showcasing your skills to networks and to actually make connections on social media and how that can help you. Um, then we'll move on to digital impact, to actually doing things, because a lot of the time the perception is that on social media you just represent yourself, that it's something actually that's somehow quite passive, but actually as researchers there are things we can actually do and make happen on social media as well that are really important. And then we'll move on to some digital issues. Um, I've done lots of talks over the last year or so on social media, and there are some recurring concerns that are always raised. So I want to try and preempt some of these, chip in with your own concerns, anything that, that worries you, why you don't want to be on social media, why you're about to desert Twitter forever, um, any of these. So we'll talk about those, some common concerns. And then we'll finish on, of course, what you all want to know, I think, the verdict. So can or can social media not? help you with your job search in academia? Can it get you a job, to simplify really simplistically the question? So it makes sense then, I'm under no illusion that you may not even know who I am. So uh, this is me virtually, this is my website. I'm Nadine Muller, I'm a lecturer in English Literature and Cultural History at Liverpool John Moores. Um, I did my PhD, I finished it in February 2012, and I started my job in August 2012 at Liverpool John Moores. Um, so that's my blog. I'm also on Twitter, and what I do on my blog is I um, represent my publications, for example. It's got lots of other sections. Um, I also showcase my teaching, so I upload my lecture slides, lecture handouts, all these kinds of things. Um, and I also run a blog called The New Academic, where I discuss, and over 60 contributors discuss, current issues in academia, from mental health to getting a job, to beginner's guides, lots of things like this. So that's to give you an insight into what I actually do. So let's start by talking about bringing your skills to life. I realise now that sounds a bit mysterious. Um, it is kind of less mysterious. So what can you actually do with social media once you're on there? How can social media help you in developing your skills and actually showcasing them and actually bringing them to life? Well, you can certainly, if you have a blog, if you are on social media, showcase your writing skills. Um, most certainly, and I think that's quite obvious. But you can also demonstrate the ability to write for different audiences. If you're writing a blog, if you're a historian, for example, you can show that you can write for other audiences than simply your peers or the people in your narrowest circle who are specialists. <coughs> what you can also do is really prove your communication skills. If people can find your online profile, your social media profiles, they will see how you communicate, at least online. They will see how you engage. You can also showcase your teaching materials, like I just showed you. <coughs> I put all my lecture handouts up. I um, 
put up any kind of <coughs> slides that I have for my lectures. And basically, it's all well and good saying in an application that you teach this and you teach this. But what people want to know is, well, how do you actually teach and are you any good at it? So actually showing people, well, look, this is the handout I did for this session or this is the presentation I did for this session gives them a real kind of first-hand experience of the materials that you design for your students. And that also means you can not just say, yes, I use innovative teaching methods, I use social media, but people can actually see how you use them. People can actually see what you mean by that. And they can see if they work. They can see if students engaged with that hashtag you created for the course. And that also means you can show that you can engage students, at least on social media. People will be able to see how you relate to your students, how you engage with them online, for example. You can also showcase your teaching experience. So I've listed all the courses on my um, website, for example, that I have taught, all the different kinds of lectures I've done. So if you go on my website and you click on teaching, you get a fairly accurate example of what I've taught, where and when, and what I've done for it. Okay? And rather than having that in a list, you get it with nice pictures, and you get it very nicely illustrated, mm -hmm. I think, at least. <laughs> And of course, what you can also show if you're on Twitter, if you take part in debates, be that via the jobs queue hashtag, for example, be that via times, times higher hashtag, the uh, slightly controversial love he hashtag, um, you can actually show that you're somehow engaged in and that you're aware of current issues in higher education, which is always something that employers will be wanting to know, even if you're an early career academic. Do you actually know what's going on? Do you know what the current problems are when it comes to student recruitment, when it comes to student numbers, targeting student numbers? So all this you can find out and engage in via social media, and it means you can actually show that, yes, I know what I'm doing. I'm part of this community. I'm not just locking myself away doing my research. What you can also do is you can actually show that your research is relevant in other areas. You can showcase impact and engagement with non-academic audiences. So you can actually show that you're trying to reach other audiences, that you're communicating to other audiences, which is something that's becoming more and more important, and I'll come back to that. Networks and recognition. Well, you can actually show that you're being collaborative. <coughs> you don't just say that on your CV, but people can actually see evidence of you <coughs> speaking to other academics, maybe in my case not just about my dog or my cat, via whatever hashtags there are, academics with dogs, academics with cats. Um, but you can also highlight that you have engagement with other people in your field. You can also show, and this could be via your own profile, this can be via the social media profile of other institutions, organizations, professional associations, that you're a member of them. Okay? You may be sitting on executive committees, etc., etc. And you can also kind of show and demonstrate that other people want to know what you think that other people who are your peers, maybe your seniors, think that you're worth asking, that your voice is worth being heard. So you can demonstrate in various ways that you are esteemed by the people within your academic circle. And then finally, of course, you can also really showcase your research. Social media allows you to showcase your publications and your ideas, and I know that there will be instantly some red lights going in your head with a word that starts with P and ends with ism, <coughs> but we'll talk about that when we come to the issues and concerns. Um, and you can also show, by kind of showcasing your research in other ways than just uploading an article, by writing blog posts on your research, which is something that Inga is going to talk about more, you can actually show why it's relevant. So social media allows you to write a blog post related to the latest news, maybe, the latest news headline, and then link in, actually, look, this is what I'm doing. This is really relevant just now. From that then, let's really think about what I mean by showcasing your skills. So it's all well and good saying, well, you can showcase, you can demonstrate, you can illustrate, you can make things look nice. But what does that actually mean? And what I really mean by that is that social media can allow you to make really valuable connections that you may otherwise not be making. And something that comes up very often at this stage when I say this is, well, doesn't that mean that I can only have a job when it's uh, about who you know and not what you know? Well, I would actually argue the opposite. Through social media, I don't come from a very privileged background. My parents aren't academics. They left school at 16. I didn't have any kind of previous connections in academia before I went to university. And actually, social media allows me 
as a kind of outsider in the beginning, to, to start talking to people who I might otherwise not have access to. Of course, that limits me to academics who are actually on social media. I understand that. But there is another way of thinking about that. It also enables people to see your work firsthand. So you can actually raise awareness of your work with people. You can actually speak to people. You can show them your work in lots of different ways, not just in the PDF of your article or the little extract of your book that might be on the published website. You can do that in lots of different innovative ways and creative ways that might really stimulate people and that may make them aware of you, most importantly. And you can also establish your voice in your discipline. It takes a very long time for articles to obviously filter through the system, for any publications to filter through the system. It takes a very long time for people to say, after lots of conferences, lots of publications, yes, so-and-so is an expert in this. What social media can do, I think, is accelerate that process a little bit. And social media can mean that actually people start to recognise what you do and they realise that for certain topics you might be one of the go-to people. So it can really help with that aspect of establishing yourself, positioning yourself in your field, in other wider debates about higher education as well. So digital impact, what do I mean by doing things and actually making a difference? Well, what I think social media does, it allows you to shape and contribute to discussions within your discipline, because you can actually have really nice conversations on social media, even though on Twitter, for example, you're limited by characters, but on other social networks, you're not. So you can be at the hub of what's happening, on the hub of what other people are doing, and it allows you to really take part in those conversations that are happening, and not just at conferences, not just in that one space, in that one physical space. It can also, and this is really important to me personally, and if, if you read my blog, you will know this, you can also contribute to and shape discussions about higher education in general. So recently there's been a resurgence of, well, I'm going to say resurgence, there's been um, the start of debates about mental health in academia, both for students, undergraduate students, PhD students, but also academic staff. And that's a topic that's really important to me, and I actually started collating things on that way before newspapers caught up to it. Also the Guardian would like to hear that. Um, so you can really kind of help make your mark if there is a kind of cause, if there is an issue in higher education. It could be access, it could be um, issues to do with race or ethnicity or anything else, equality and diversity. You know, here is a platform where you can really raise your voice about this. And through that, there will be other bigger voices, like newspapers, catching on to it and potentially asking you for comment. And of course, you can also make contact with new audiences non-academic audiences for your research via social media, because believe it or not, it's not just academics that use social media. Um, and you can also make contact with potential collaborators. And what I mean by all of this is that things can actually happen on social media. It's not just some passive medium through which you just showcase things, where you just put things online and you say, ta-da, and that's it. If you are actively engaged in social media, if you actually make use of your profiles, if you make the effort to talk to people, you can make things happen. I'll give you an example. So in my field, English literature, achieving impact or public engagement can, can be quite difficult because what we do is read books most of the time, right? Um, maybe look at some art, maybe look at some historical documents. So I currently work on a cultural history of the widow in Britain from the 19th century onwards. So actually making contact with widows groups, widows associations in Britain, has helped me to get together a group of volunteers who want to engage with some of the materials that I've uncovered. That would have been really, really a lot more difficult without social media, because I was able to actually make contact with those groups. They then were able to pass on my contact details to their members. There were other people who are not part of those groups who responded to my call. So you can really, if you target the right people, if you know what you're looking for, and if you know what you want to do, you can make things happen. It's not just about showing yourself. It's not just like a shop front window, okay? And of course, and I think this is something that Andy and Inga are gonna talk a little bit more about, you can measure your readership numbers. So if you want, um, <coughs> you can start to <coughs> use old metrics, you can start to use figures and actually attach them to your readership. I can tell you exactly how many people have accessed my blog. 
over the last year, the last month, the last <coughs> day, I can tell you where they're from. And you can also <coughs> record the impact that your research has, maybe through comments, etc., etc. And I know these are really still really shaky terms, especially as we're looking towards the next rep. So I'll give you an example. These are the stats for February from, from my blog. So I know exactly how many users I've had. Um, I can see how that correlates to how active I've been on Twitter or not, or if I've been tweeting more about my dog or more about my blog. <laughs> um, I can see where they come from. There's some really sad white spots there. Um, I can see that they're mainly from the UK. I'm not quite as international as Inga is. Um, I can see exactly how many people from what countries. I like to think Germany, that's just my dad daily logging on. Um, and I can also see are they male, female, and what's really interesting for me, because I write a lot for early career researchers and academics and younger academics and PhD students, is the age group. So the main age group that stands out for me, for my blog, is 25 to 34. So these things are actually really helpful to measure, because we are in a time where some people are still asking, well, why do this? Why invest time in it? But as soon as you're able to attach numbers to it, as soon as I'm able to say, actually, five to 7,000 people, individuals, look at my blog every year, and I can see exactly what pages they accessed, what works, what didn't work, what are the issues that people really want to know about, and still the most important post, the most read post, is one by Dr. Caroline Edwards, who wrote on um, academic job interviews and how to be good at them. And I can see every month that trumps all of them, and right underneath that is how to do a good academic job application. So it can really give me an idea for what do people want to know, who reads my blog, who looks at my research. So you can, to a certain extent, measure what's going on. You can measure who engages with your work, with what you say, and you can reach out. So that makes me sound a little bit like I'm this uncritical advocate or advertising person for Twitter, for social media, for blogs, WordPress, whatever other platforms you can think of. But in order to maybe preempt or start some discussion, please feel free to, to chip in or nod vehemently if I now raise a concern that you really have been thinking about. Um, I want to think about some of the concerns that a lot of people have, a lot of academics have, PhD students, um, and also people pre-PhD stage. So perhaps the, the, maybe the least serious one, let's start with that, is procrastination. And there is, um, I don't just mean videos of dogs snoring <laughs> or anything like this. Well, Social media doesn't take that away. Social media will not compensate for publications, and I'll come back to that in a little while. So there is a real balance to strike with, well, how much time are you spending on it, and how much time are you spending on all the other things that you should be doing, okay? And we'll come back to that and discuss it a little bit more. Um, and related to that, really, is what, it sounds so managerial, but I can't think of a better word, strategic workload management. So. In no job spec does it say social media five hours a week, right? It took me a week, nine till five, to teach myself how to make my website look like I wanted it to look. We're talking <coughs> replace that number one with a five and see what happens. That, that is literally where it started. Um, you don't have to do it like that. You can do a blog really, really quickly, as I'm sure Inga will tell you later, so please don't think that if you want to start one, that, that's what it is like. That's just a slightly obsessive nature of my personality, I think. But nevertheless, it, it takes time. It takes time to constantly be looking at your smartphone, updating your Twitter, updating Google+, updating LinkedIn, uh, academia.edu, ResearchGate, everything. And there are really handy apps that Andy might be talking about, I think, um, that allow you to do everything <coughs> at once, which is great, but still, it, it's a privilege to have that time to spend, right? And we need to remember that, I think. So I think what's really important is that you have to consider why you want to use social media, what you want to get out of it, and what proportionately can you put into it. So don't just see it as some extra that you do at 11 o'clock at night when you're just in bed, you send another tweet. Think carefully about how you can actually build it into your workload and be realistic about it is part of your workload. Yes, for me it's become kind of second nature, but that can also be really dangerous because we learn to not distinguish anymore between work and anything else really. Okay. Um, training, really briefly, and events like this make, make this a lot easier I think. Very often, we're, we're kind of expected to do all these things. It's very good to disseminate your research. 
but actually how many people have had their university offer workshops on how to set up a WordPress blog, what the Twitter kind of rules and regulations are to their eye. So there is a really basic fundamental issue at the moment, I think, that universities and other providers aren't living up to the skills provision, the basic skills training. Instead, we sit at home and kind of do trial and error and kind of teach ourselves, again, time that probably could be spent on perhaps better things, right? Especially if you could cool everyone into a room and just teach them in a day how to use WordPress and how to set up a blog and what's good practice, what doesn't work. So there is an issue there, I think. Um, image and privacy is one that comes up again and again and again. So actually, a lot of people run, well, I say a lot, I don't have any numbers for this. Um, a lot of people run, say, a private Twitter account and a public one. I don't. It's been suggested to me that maybe I should, but I don't, because I, I can't see the point, because that is part of my, I don't know, my calling, <laughs> is that actually I want, I want people, especially PhD students, <coughs> to see that, no, I don't work 24-7, believe it or not. Yes, I do go running with my dog, and you know what? That's fine. It's okay not to write your thesis 24-7. You don't need to, it's a thesis. Um, so that, that there is a point to why I also tweet personal things. So that's why you will be bombarded with pet pictures if you follow me on Twitter. Mm. Um, for better or worse, obviously. Yeah. Depends on what your take on pets is. So <coughs> there is often that question of, well, everyone can see it. So what do I want to, to have privately to myself? What do I maybe not want people to see? And also, oh, what will make me look weird? And some of the key issues sometimes is that um, some people even go as far as to say, well, if I'm on social media a lot, will people think I'm a bad academic? Because shouldn't I really be spending time on other things? Shouldn't I be just solitarily writing all the time, practically? And as soon as I'm on social media, it means I'm not doing that, which means it'll look bad. Um, which I think is a completely unrealistic thing. That's like the idea that I don't walk my dog, because if I'm walking my dog, I'm not working. Um, so there are some issues surrounding what you want people to see, um, what you say publicly, and I think this is one of the key things to keep in mind. Remember that people can find anything and everything, even your deleted tweets. Um, <coughs> but that really shouldn't put you off. <coughs> really, we're all intelligent people. We should be able to determine what's better left unsaid on a public platform like Twitter and what is maybe a good idea to say. So in a way, it is shaping an image of yourself to a certain extent, right? Yeah. Hi, Nadine. Hi. Um, I have a personal blog, yeah. and I'm um, starting a doctor in August, and I felt the need to start like a research blog. Yeah. And I put one post there, and I had um, one of my mentors comment on it and say, oh, do you feel the need to start another blog? And what's your view on that? I just felt mm. like I need to separate my research from my other blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. Can I ask what the other blah, blah, blah is? <laughs> Um, what, what would you be blogging on on your yeah, personal normally blog? Normally, I just I blog about my day to day experiences and what I learned from it. There's a bit of humor. Mm. I talk about my kids. Um, I mean, it's just it's a mixture of just me on a journey of life and yeah. going from well, an engineer, which is what I was, to where I am now. Personally, I think it it should be your your choice, whatever you're comfortable with. I don't think that this is one of the important <coughs> things I'll come back to in the end. Is we often <coughs> think that there are some sort of rules that we should abide by. That there is social media, it has lots of rules and we have to fit into them. Actually, to a very, to a very large extent, it should be the other way around. You can make social media fit to whatever you want. So if you're more comfortable with that, of having them separate, I can't see any issue why, why you wouldn't. Um, on the other hand, what, what I would, if that was me, I would certainly combine them. Because I would find it quite attractive that actually people can see, look, I do this really you know, intellectual work, but actually, hey, I'm also a parent, and I'm also juggling all sorts of other things, you know, which I think makes for a more rounded person and which fits nicely with my agenda of actually showing a more rounded kind of work ethic and approach <laughs> to life, I think, to a certain extent, if that makes sense. But don't feel pushed, you know, just because your mentor thinks you should have just one blog or because other people say you should separate it, make it more private, hide it away. Think about what will you mind? So if, if someone approaches you and asks you about your personal blog in an academic setting, if that makes you uncomfortable, then maybe, you know, separate it. But if you're happy with that, 
then that's perfectly fine. It's completely up to you. Shape it to what you want it to be. Well, I'll come back to that slightly. It's just about shaping. It sounds very ominous. Um, I'll come back to that in the end as well. Does that help? Yes, it does. Um, so yes, image and privacy. What do you want to keep to yourself? And ultimately, you can decide. It's not like all of a sudden you start tweeting and you're like, oh my god, everyone's going to see it, but I have to do it, but I have to do it. But yeah. you don't. You can, you can pick. You know, <laughs> No one's tweeting for you. No one's putting things out there all of a sudden. Um, and if you wanted to, you could even tweet under the name of your research project. Your blog doesn't even have to be under your name. It could be mentioned somewhere that it's run by you. But if you're more comfortable actually calling it, I don't know, Roman History 101, th there's no one to say you can't do that. There's no one to say you can't take on the identity of your, your research project or however you might want to see that. Um, and then here we go, plagiarism and copyright. One of the quickest questions that comes firing at me is, but oh my god, you blog about your research? And then a lot of, I think this is perhaps more alien to the ads and humanities people among us and more akin to the scientists, a lot of people go, but what if my findings were wrong? What if actually in a month's time I change my mind? Well, on the one hand, I hope you do, because we're researchers. We're supposed to change our minds according to what we find. Mm -hmm. And you can then record that. That's a perfectly natural process. Uh -huh. That's the whole idea of research. If you don't do that, I think you're quite a bad researcher. Being a researcher and being intellectually inquisitive means being able to change your mind, depending on what your evidence is, depending on what your sources are. So I don't think that should be an issue, really, as long as you can then kind of document it and actually say, actually, what I wrote a month ago or a year ago, I'm kind of changing my take on this because recently this has been published or I found this. Why, why is that not valid? Why should someone then go, oh, my God, no, they published something wrong two months ago. We're not going to hire them. It, it, to me, that, that's a completely alien way of thinking in a way. And then... Um, <laughs> Secondly, the idea of plagiarism. I have always taken the approach that, to me, that, that doesn't even enter my mind, because the moment I blog about my research, I've blogged about original archive findings that no one's ever worked on, uh, lovely songs about widows from the Victorian period, about saucy widows in Pimlico, um, <laughs> yeah, to everyone's amusement, I think. Um, and my name's attached to it, immediately, it says the date stamp. This is the date that I blogged about it. This is the date that I started thinking about this. When I tweet ideas on Twitter, there's a record. I've put my name to that topic, to that material. And I can prove that. It, it's there. My footprint is there, right? The, the kind of virtual footprint that I've tried to show you in the sand there, in a very uh, Coventry-esque beach. <laughs> so, to me personally, and I might be simplifying this here, that, that's not an issue. I have heard from people who felt that they had been plagiarized, but I think you have the proof to show that. You have the date stamp, you have the name attached. No matter if your blog is yourself or not, as long as you can prove that you run that blog, that you've done this work, then your name is attached to that. So I think that's something that very often preoccupies academics, um, but maybe actually doesn't need to preoccupy us quite as much as we think. So, the verdict then. Um, social media and your career. Here it goes. This is perhaps I should just shorten this to five minutes, shouldn't I? And just start with this and then end. Um, a lot of the time, I get the odd frustrated voice in the room when I talk about social media. And people raise their hands and say, well, but I'm a researcher. I shouldn't have to do all this to get a job. Well, no. No one is going to give you a job because you're on Twitter. No one is even going to give you a job if Barack Obama follows you on Twitter, right? <laughs> no university is going to hire you because you have a blog. That is the top and bottom of it, right? So do not think I'm never going to get a job if I'm not on social media. I have first-hand experience of new colleagues who I can't find anywhere <laughs> on the internet, okay? Um, which is disconcerting, of course. You can imagine I'm Googling and I can't find anything, and I'm like, oh my God, it may not exist. Um, so, but, and here is but, and this is why I have those different paths, which I hope will feed together now. It can really, really help you, because it can make people aware of you. It can give you opportunities. So let's think about the hiring committee's folks, <coughs> like I just said. The 
hiring committee is not going to sit there and say, they have a Twitter account, shortlist. They don't out. That is absolutely not how it works. And we all know this, right? Mm. So um, the hiring committee will probably not care if you have a Twitter account. They will probably not care if you have 20,000 followers. But, and here is the big, big but, opportunities. I sometimes show my postgraduate students my CV with everything deleted that has resulted from social media. All the invites that have come from people for keynotes on my research, talks like this one about social media, um, any other kind of talks, consultancy, everything that would not have happened, even publications that I've been invited to do because people have seen me on my blog, have seen me on Twitter, have interacted with me there. If I deleted all those, my CV would still stand, don't worry, it wouldn't be deleted entirely or anything like this, but it's considerable. The amount of opportunities that can come your way if you present yourself on social media and engage with people is amazing. And actually that is something that hiring committees might look at. You do know they look at publications. So that invited publication from someone with whatever press it might be, that will look good. They will look at the fact that, oh, look, this is an ECR, but they've already done five, six keynotes last year. They will definitely look at that, external esteem indicators. People from peer-reviewed journals can find you much easier and your expertise and invite you to actually review that manuscript that's just been submitted. That is a really good CV kick, right? So there are opportunities that you can create for yourself. And I hesitate to call them luck because I always think as academics, I'm supposed to be um, feeling lucky that I got my job. Actually, I worked bloody hard for it. I said I wouldn't swear and just tweeted that before. <laughs> but I did work bloody hard for it. There's no other way of phrasing it. Um, and actually, yes, to a certain extent, there is luck. There, there are things that come together. But yes, I did do the work for it. So, and it's the same with these opportunities. You put yourself out there. You put yourself in a good position to be found. Strategy is really important. Do not go on social media just because you think, I have to be on social media. I have to send another tweet. Now I hate it. I hate it so much. <coughs> don't, don't you know, think about a blog post for weeks and think, oh my god, it's really time that I do another one. Think about what you want from social media. If you already have a blog, if you already have a Twitter account, reconsider today why you have it and what you want from it in a pro professional capacity. If you don't know what you want from it, no one else will and it won't happen. You have to kind of mold it and shape it to what you expect from it and to what you want it to be. And you have to be strategic with it. If it takes over your life, and you're delaying your book publication by two years because you tweeted too much, <laughs> that is probably not strategic, is it? <laughs> so finally then, and this is something that I said before, make social media work for you. There are really, well, I don't want to say there are no rules that makes it sound like some kind of the, the ultimate form of democracy and freedom. It's not. There are, of course, limitations on all social media platforms. But you can make it work for you. Do not feel like, oh my God, I don't know, is this what you do when you, when you tweet? Is this what you do? Learn the basics, see how other people tweet, see what you like, go to other blogs, get some ideas of what other people do and think about what fits you. What fits your strategy and what are you going to do? You don't have to have all social media platforms. Use the ones that you think will be helpful to you. Don't burden yourself with any kind of duties. Don't do social media because you feel guilty, okay? Do it because it has a purpose for you and you want to achieve that purpose and that should determine how you use it. So with that in mind, I, I thank you now. Um, any questions? You may have typed them. Has anyone, no, I don't, I doubt anyone's used the Socrates. Oh, oh, oh no, you didn't, sorry. Just too happy there, I thought you did. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that um, universities aren't providing enough training I'm trying that nobody seems to know where this training should fit. Mm -hmm. So whose responsibility is it? I mean, is it really to the university, as you say? Or <coughs> should the department, should the library, any other department be taking responsibility? I definitely think it's the duty of um, what's very often, well, it'll have different names in different universities and different types of universities, but really it's um, the research skills and training people who should be providing it. 
So the people who talk to you about what will happen in your Bible or the people who train you how to be a PhD supervisor if you're in a new job, I think it, it totally fits into that mold. It fits into that mold of how to disseminate your research. So fair enough, you can't teach impact, for example, you know, because the regulations surrounding that are so complex of what counts, what doesn't count. Um, but you can start telling people how they might start doing it, and it's the same for social media, I think. At the very least, you need to provide people with the ability to set up their own blog and give them that kind of support. Because if we're encouraged to do that, and you will see now that almost every funding application, certainly for my funding council, which is the AHRC, says, what are your long-term plans for dissemination? And nowadays, you can't get away without having an online platform for your project, without having some sort of website record of what that funded project did. Where's the training for that? How many of you would write in a grant application, actually, I need someone to train me for that, and that counts into the cost? No one does. So I think universities have a big responsibility, um, especially with, with looking towards the REF, to actually provide that kind of skills training for academics specifically. Does that make sense? Where it kind of fits? <laughs> yeah? Uh, two things. Here at work, we do provide that training. We have um, a program called DigiTools, which the research group here yeah. did that for us. So that was really cool. But then the comment I wanted to make is this. We're, we're in a very precarious moment right now in terms of um, the digital world that many of us are interested in and the old school who still runs the academy. Mm -hmm. Now, the old school who still runs the academy, they have a couple of problems with the things that you would have just said today, okay? Uh, first of all, they hate social media. I mean, I made a comment the other day in my department meeting, the English department, about, um, uh, what is it called, alt, um, I can't remember that. Alt metrics. The alt metrics, right, alt metrics. And the comment was shut down, the meeting was ended, and this, this cloud just came down over like, shut up, Christine. <laughs> And then afterwards, I was talking to a colleague, and I said, you know, it's really important that we start thinking about it. He says, well, that's what you young people in your generation, I'm 52, he was 44. <laughs> <laughs> so they set up this kind of mentality, right, about how, you know, we're in a whole world. So that was one thing. But then the other thing, and, and I thought this, this, this is like my whole life. I've had three different careers. Mm -hmm. My first career was in, in body work, I'm a massage therapist. My second career was in psychotherapy, I'm a psychotherapist. My third career, I was in the English department, although I'm a temporary post, so I was in the English department. Mm -hmm. I have never, ever been funded for anything. I've applied to all kinds of grants, never been funded. And I've asked the question to different mentors, why? And they say, Christian, look at your CV. They don't look like a scholar, because you do these different things, right? So if I were to be myself, the massage therapist, the psychotherapist, and the scholar, I would continue in that problem of mm -hmm. never being funded. So my Twitter account, everything that I do in my academic social media doesn't whisper a word about anything else that I do. Mm -hmm. Because we're still in that world right now where they have this thought about what a scholar looks like. Mm -hmm. He did his undergraduate at Oxford, he did Absolutely. his master's at Oxford, then he went maybe to Yale. That's right, that's exactly what I meant by you having to shape your image. Yeah. To, I suppose to your advantage or what you think will be your advantage. Mm -hmm. And I think, it, I agree. 100% with you. I certainly don't necessarily fit in um, the kind of person that, that would be an academic. Um, I still struggle to explain to my parents what I actually do. <laughs> you know, the word research kind of keeps coming up or teaching. Um, but what I would say, and I know this isn't kind of, well, I, th I think it is practical actually. What, what I would say is that I feel a very, very deep-rooted sense of responsibility, which is why I put myself out there with very uncomfortable topics, which is why I blog about, um, or have blogged about, my past issues with anxiety, which of course have stirred up issues, you know, should we be talking about this, should your students know about this? Well, my students love this, because lots of them struggle with all sorts of mental health issues, and they like the idea of actually, okay, maybe, maybe I'm not so weird, maybe I can go and speak to someone about this. Um, so, I think the responsibility that we have is, I'm privileged in the sense that I am in post now, right? I have a permanent job. 
I don't think that means I should now rest on my laurels. What I want to make sure is actually that people see the kind of person I am to the extent that I think I can afford it. And hopefully that will filter down generation by generation of new academics, you know, which as you say is the ideal. Can just filter it out. Um, mm -hmm. But also the, the other idea I suppose is there's only so long you can resist. Social media, if you like it or not, is part of it. Lots of people still, I don't know, some very ancient people still don't like email. <laughs> or have the PAs do it for them. I mean, how long, how long is that going to last? Right? I think it's the same kind of vein. Um, you will meet very few people who still insist on typing their manuscripts or their books on a typewriter now. <laughs> you know, social media has kind of become part of our lives. And I think we do need to be critical about the role it plays in our research. We do have to be very critical about, right, <coughs> you know, we can't judge people by whether or not they have a social media profile, mm -hmm. but we certainly need to be open-minded about how we can use it rather than just shutting <coughs> it out. But I can't say any more than that, that, that we have a responsibility to try, I think, and change that once we're in a position to, in a less precarious position than many people, and that often means a kind of permanent employment contract. Um, and also that I think we need to start changing it from the inside, I suppose. <laughs> I'm not comfortable with thinking. Yes? Because your hand is highest, sorry, try harder next time. You're using the term social media as if it's one big sort of lump of all the same. <coughs> uh, can you give any guidance? Because this, I mean, new aspects of social media pop up practically every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can get sucked into these things um, and suddenly discover you're getting hundreds of photographs because somebody signed you, signed you up for Pinterest or something. <laughs> um, yeah. um, uh, how on earth do you find your way through this morass? This is exactly the kind of question that really <coughs> um, universities should be answering in training. You know, the, I mean, I, I yeah. created a website. <laughs> For, for students specifically, actually, for undergraduate students, not necessarily for postgraduates, but um, it's a website where students explain to each other what's good and bad about certain social media platforms and how they can use it to find careers after their undergraduate degree. So I think we need those kinds of things. And this is why I'm saying, you know, you need to look at things and try them out, but also be prepared to just ditch them. If you look at it and you don't like it, it doesn't feel right, or you don't think you're gonna get the results that you want, then ditch them, but otherwise, you know, there is LinkedIn, there is Google+, Plus, there is YouTube, something that, that we don't often actually associate when we talk about social media um, as researchers, but which can actually be quite handy. Um, and I know that today's talks are probably going to be on YouTube, for example, so it is kind of handy. Um, so yes, it, it's not that lump. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, and obviously I'm using the term as a collective term for practical purposes here. Um, but it is about looking at the different platforms and actually deciding what works for you and what doesn't without getting sucked in because you feel you have to. Does that make sense? But, but, but one of the problems is the, the assumption is that social media are just some sort of neutral free entity and an, no. and an increasing number of them are, are being owned by organisations mm -hmm. who are manipulating them in, in various ways. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and is there a developing understanding um, that, you know, if you use different search engines, you end up in, in totally different places because of the mm -hmm. way they're being manipulated? Mm -hmm. But I suppose we're not talking about search engines now, and I absolutely do not believe that social media is this kind of utopian space <laughs> of freedom and neutrality. Um, it absolutely isn't, but I do think we can use it to, to an effect to hopefully counteract some of the more negative implications mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I think it's possibly the word social, because I think of social as opposed to employment. Mm -hmm. And I think of Facebook and Twitter as social media and academia.edu and ResearchGate as to do with employment and work. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's possibly why, <coughs> why there's a bit of confusion about how <coughs> social media can actually be relevant to work. And of course the irony of that is <coughs> that academia.edu and ResearchGate are so restrictive that really all they're doing is replicating your CV online in a very boring way. They don't actually allow you to communicate anything differently, I'm sorry. They just encourage you to put your CV online 
in various forms, as does to a certain extent, I suppose, LinkedIn. Mm. Um, so that's actually the irony, is that, yeah, you say, you know, we're resistant to social media, perhaps, because we don't associate it with professionalism, because it's called social, but actually that's the space, I think, where we do have alternative creative <laughs> opportunities in the way in which we present content. Whilst perhaps people are more comfortable with academia.edu, because you can't really upload photos. <laughs> All you do is just, where have you given a paper recently? Whilst I much prefer to write a short blog post with some pictures I took of the birds that are outside, I still don't know what they're called. Are they more hens? Um, <laughs> with the big feet, right? So I much prefer <coughs> doing that and talking about the conference and actually giving some, some visual stimulus with it, as I would for my students. I wouldn't just put a PDF <laughs> of my talk on the screen and say, Today we're going to talk about post-humanism. Who does that? And I think it's the same with social media. That's not how I would present my research on social media. That's not what I pre would present to my students. So why would I try to present it like that to any other audience, even other academics? I mean, we all have an attention span, like it or not, <laughs> which is why I completely switch off when a talk that's supposed to last 20 minutes goes over 20 minutes. She said, looking at the clock. <laughs> you know, so um, I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Maybe that is where the resistance comes from, and that is pro probably why people feel more comfortable, is because it's the boring standard way that they allow us to present things on those professional networks. Yeah. I think you just out the head there. The problem with things like research games, particularly for ECRs, which, you know, any form of part of the development of the future. Without the investment of things on various media to tell people what else young researchers do, that's the biggest problem with things on mm. research gate, isn't it? They haven't. Uh, 60, 70, 80 percent of it I can't put on research gate because the categories just don't fit. Yeah. I don't even know how to. I want. I would put this talk up today <coughs> because it asked me. It wants to create an <coughs> SSM for things, and I'm like, whoa. Well, why? What? You know, it, it's it's very restrictive. I think. That as well, but, um, we're talking about training, one of the things... Yeah. Which is where, because you're saying that, which is where um, those kind of consultancy and workshop invitations came from, because clearly people don't have the kinds of people who can talk about it. And it's also very difficult to talk about it, I suppose, just from a tech support or just from a research support point of view. It's very difficult to talk about it unless you yourself involve in being an academic researcher and teacher at the same time and how to navigate those different issues, absolutely.